Now this CO2 20 from the baseline is only true for patients who have CO2 retention. If you do not have CO2 retention, you need to go for a PA, for a so for a PCO2 between 35 and 45. However, those who have a CO2 retention, say with the best of the efforts, you are only able to bring down the PCO2 to 50. In those patients, you need to target above 20. And that would be 70 in this patient, where the CO2 was starting at 50. So that's where we need to understand. These are the finer intricate things, the finesses, which you understand to how to do this test and how to interpret the results. Another one, declared brain dead, another ABG for your perusal. Now here, every other thing is fine except sodium of 186 in the pre-test and post-test 185. Now remember guys, one of the precondition is to have physiology close to normal. If you have, don't have the physiology close to normal, you should not be even starting to test. Now, hypernatremia is a very common complication in patients who are brainstem death because they went, go into diabetes insipidus, they have a large amount of free water loss and once the free water loss is very, very large, they basically start becoming hypernatremic very rapidly. So we need to remember that the donor management should be such, the donor maintenance should be shut, such that the hyperkalemia, the hypernatremia just does not occur. We are able to replace the volume reasonably well and keep the sodium below 160. The acceptable range is anywhere between 140 and 160 for you to do the brainstem dead testing. So again, this whole test needs to be discarded and they need to go and correct the sodium and do both the testings again. Patient has a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Remember, generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Generalized tonic-clonic seizure, the answer is patient is not dead. Patient is not dead. The patient will be having some neural connection. The reticular endothelial system has to be intact. The fibers go through the brain stem. They have to be intact for a patient to throw a GTC. So if you see a GTC, if you see a decorticate or a decerebrate posturing, any posturing, any convulsion, patient is not brain dead, period. You don't need to think in terms of brain dead and diagnosis of brain death at all. So that's very, very clear. So this is not a brain stem death patient. Okay, somebody who is seizing, is having convulsion, is not a brain stem death patient. Let's go to our next one. This is again a, a real life scenario. Patient, 26 year old, hanging at home. Patient brought in, uh, essentially became brain dead because of severe hypoxic injury to the brain. Initially, the family wanted to consider organ donation. We went ahead with the testing. And then obviously the, the family refused. And what happened? Um, obviously they had a very, uh, very eye for a detail. They would keep a watch on everything. But once you are dead, the heart eventually does stop. And that's what happened around four days later, the heart stopped. Now as per the law, because we had done the brain stem death testing four days ago, the cause of death, the timing of death was written four days ago. Whereas when the postmortem was being referred, this patient was referred for a postmortem, the question was, did the patient die today because of the heart arrest or did he die four days ago because of the brain stem death? Now, these are several certain conditions where you have to take a view in which you do not hurt the sentiments of the family. Anyways, the acceptance of brain stem death was not there with this family. So, we just went ahead and gave her time of death as a time of cardiac arrest rather than actually trying to impress upon them that the death had happened four days ago. Once the acceptance of brainstem death would have been there, that would have been a different scenario. But since there was no acceptance of the brainstem death, we continued with just the cardiac arrest at the time of death. So these are some of the decisions which one has to take at the bedside. They might sound to be difficult, but trust me, if you know the subject well, if you know what you are doing and understand it clearly, these are not a problems at all. So last uh, case to talk about, uh, CT scan of a brain does show that during the CT angio, there is a little bit of residual blood flow into the intracranial compartment. Now what happens is around 10% of the patients may show some flow in the intracranial compartment into the internal carotids, just 10% of them. That's just the residual push of the contrast which you see. That's not anything to do with the intracranial flow being present. You will see a cutoff anyway at the level of internal carotid or just above the, into the internal carotid and that is considered to be consistent with a positive ancillary test for brainstem death. So you need to understand how to interpret that. Anyways, the ancillary test currently do not have any role in our law. We are only using ancillary tests for confirmation of doctor's suspicion or sometimes for relatives to understand the whole process and have a closure of a sort. 
So there is no role right now for using ancillary test as a test to diagnose. However, I feel the science is correct. If you are not able to do a brainstem dead testing in somebody who has a C3, C4 or above fracture or whose eyes have been swollen uh, and not able to open and not able to elicit eye signs or the eardrum is ruptured and you are not able to do a cold caloric test in such patients, uh, testing of the circulation of the brain using a CT angiography or a four vessel angiography may be prudent and scientific as well. And many countries have adopted that as a method. However, currently as the law stands in our country, we do not use ancillary testing for declaration of brainstem death.